to debating today. Uh, professor David Epstein is a uh, professor of political science at Columbia University. And he will be going up against Peter Schiff, who is president of Europe Pacific Capital, a brokerage firm. And he did become renowned for predicting the upcoming economic collapse. And uh, with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Professor Nicholas Johnson. <laughs> So the format today is um, roughly a traditional debate. Um, the speakers will have each 15 minutes, uh, I will moderate, uh, we'll have about seven minutes of rebuttal and then after the rebuttal we'll have some moderator exchange and also um, just some Q&A from uh, the audience. Um, I'll sit in the middle and try and then keep them from getting at each other too badly. And, uh, <coughs> Speak from our start entering a recession and see what percent of jobs have been lost and we're now officially the worst uh, on on the graph and this is all the recessions back to 48 so we're you know, since the Great Depression now this is the worst in terms of percent of job losses you'll notice by the way the previous two recessions are this one and this one uh, they were rather shallow ones in terms of job losses so we, we've grown a little bit uh, you know, unaccustomed to having sharp recessions uh, in, in the last few decades, the ones before the early 80s weren't too bad either. You have to go back to the 70s to find ones that really had fun. Uh, so that picture is grim. Uh, the housing market also, as we know, is not looking very, very good right now either. Housing starts have gone way down uh, since their peak sometime in, in early 2006. And housing prices, as we all know, collapsed. And this is kind of a classic picture of an asset bubble collapsing. Um, real inflation adjusted housing prices have been more or less stable between $125,000, $150,000 since the early 70s. Suddenly in the late 90s, they decided to balloon up uh, to about twice that, right? $250,000 plus. Uh, and now they started sharply coming back down. Like different pictures will show you whether or not we're kind of at where we were before, still have some ways to go. This one makes it look like we still have a ways to go. So the housing market is also quite grim, and of course the foreclosures um, are still going keep hitting all-time highs. Um, so we get almost 9,000 foreclosures um, in a month, and that's uh, that's, fine. that's far and away the worst we've been. So the picture is grim. Uh, the question is, what does this mean for Obama's performance? That's our topic of discussion today. How are we to evaluate the administration's role in all this? Uh, you know, it's clear that times were bad when he took over. So the question is, what have his policies done uh, relative to where we could be uh, with some other kinds of policies? Uh, so I'm going to argue that you can't understand how well they've done unless we understand what came before. How did we get? into the situation we're in now. Relative to that, what has the administration done and what's left to do? Uh, so the chief sheet, uh, if you were to jump ahead, there's no surprise given my position in this debate. I think that Obama and the administration have overall done quite well. Uh, they've done what's necessary. That the 
specific situation that we had a year ago, uh, late 2008, was extremely explosive uh, and that it required vigorous action. Together, the Treasury, the Fed, and the administration have put a lot of energy into it. Uh, they, by and large, kind of slowed the rate of decline. I think there's more we need to do to keep things getting better. Uh, but at least we're not in the calamity we could have been in. So that's, that's something to take away. All right, so how did we get to be where we are? I think some of these specifics are important. So the story begins uh, with a market for home loans. Uh, life used to be simple. Uh, you contacted your local bank. Uh, you said, I want to buy a house. So you signed a loan agreement. You get the house. The bank gets the money. You pay it off over time. It's nice and simple. Uh, the savings and loans used to follow what was called the 363 rule, which is uh, pay for deposits of 3%, loan it up at 6%, and 3 o'clock tea time. So it used to be a rather boring business of just lending people money for, for houses. Then, in the 90s and on into this, this decade, it's turned into high finance. So lots of banks have all these loans from lots of different customers. Uh, and instead of just everybody keeping their own loans and waiting for them to mature, they started pooling them. Uh, the first vehicles were what were called REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts. Uh, and then uh, even more complicated ones where you would slice and dice these different uh, loans. And so they combine house loans with, say, consumer credit loans, credit cards and things, and you know, anything that required payments on a monthly basis. And they would slice and dice them to SPV, Special Purpose Vehicles, the collateralized debt obligations. Uh, so they create a structure whereby, say, one class of investors can you know, take a you know, hundred or a thousand different consumers. They're all supposed to be paying off mortgages and consumer credit each month. Uh, the first 5% of payments would go to the first class of creditors. Then the next, you know, say, 10% would go to the, a second class, and the rest would go to a third class. So they uh, make, they make consumer payments, including mortgage payments, into a financial asset. And that these were then sold all over the world. People were eager to buy into these. So during most of this decade, through 2008, uh, we kind of had this simmering set of affairs. Consumers were supporting the economy. Actually, uh, real incomes weren't doing much. Real median incomes were, in fact, falling. It's the first time they've ever fallen peak to peak. So people were not making a lot of money, but they kept buying because their home prices kept going up, so they felt wealthier. So spending continued, continued. Housing prices continued to bubble up, as we saw before. People kept feeling richer and richer. Banks would buy these assets, these kind of investment assets that we saw before, not only U.S. banks, but banks all over the world. They're, the ratings agencies rated uh, these kinds of obligations, like these CDOs, on the same scale that they used to rank uh, the kind of debt that a single company would issue. So, you know, GE issues debt, they'll rate that AAA, AAA minus, AA, whatever. The first time ever they used that same scale to rate something that wasn't a single company uh, debt obligation. It was this kind of funny investment vehicle. And lots of banks all, all over the world were under constraints that you can only invest in AAA uh, securities. And there's not a whole lot of AAA stuff out there. So when the US housing market started churning out these AAA securities that paid pretty good rates, everybody flocked to them. So banks all over the world thought this is the thing to do. And they got involved in the US housing market. Um, and this kind of built on itself so the consumers were happy about the housing prices being high, the banks were making lots of profits, at least on paper, um, and everybody was happy. Nobody noticed that, or nobody was paying close attention to the fact uh, that we, weren't, we didn't have a good finger on the underlying asset values, right? So we didn't know what is the probability that somebody pays off their mortgages. We know there are all these liars' loans and so on and so forth. Um, but the originators would get it. They'd hand it off to investment banks. Investment banks would get the ratings agencies to give, a, to give the highest tranche or the first set of paybacks as AAA rating. And then it would eventually, mortgages would be held by people who had no idea who actually was supposed to pay back these loans. Right? So as opposed to the, the world where you, it's you and your local banker 
and they know that Mr. and Mrs. Jones have bought this house and they have this mortgage, now somewhere off in Hong Kong owns a very you know, tiny slice of that mortgage, as is someone in Indonesia and on Wall Street in Europe and all over the world. Nobody really knew what was going on. They were overpaying for these assets anyway, and the whole system was about to collapse, and indeed, of course, it did. So once housing prices started to fall, uh, everything fell apart. Consumers which had supported the economy weren't willing to do that anymore. Their housing prices started falling. They were retrenching. They're buying less things. Businesses worried that people are going to be buying their things, start laying off workers because they don't need to produce as much. That leads to further declines in income, and you know, producers produce even less. You get this downward spiral of production. At the same time, banks all over the world said, oops, all the stuff that we just invested in, often in a highly leveraged way, they borrowed money to buy these AAA assets. They're in real trouble. So for the first time since the Great Depression, we have a simultaneous deep recession caused by the collapse of an asset bubble. Uh, in the Great Depression, it was stock prices. Now it was housing prices. So you have this Great Recession combined simultaneously with a banking crisis, uh, where banks are looking at something. So this is the, the emergency that we found ourselves in late 2008. All right. So what happened? We, you know, we saw the unemployment's going up. We saw housing. There's a credit freeze, and it's just hard to obtain loans. Even now, when banks are actually starting to make some profits again, they're not making it because they're loaning money out. Um, and we'll look more of that later. So there's a credit freeze throughout the economy. Consumer spending goes down off the map. Uh, investment, the kind of top line investment numbers, start falling off. And you know, in economics, uh, GDP is C plus I plus G. All right, so you have uh, consumer spending investment in government. And the first two components of that are falling way off. There's this official measure called the output gap. That's the difference between what the economy could be producing given all the resources available and what it is producing. And that, you, know, you can see this recession here, which you know, is a kind of projection of how we might bounce back in future years, but this output graph grew hugely uh, to where it was estimated somewhere between 1.2 and 1.8 trillion at the end of 2008. Right, so that's the recession we found ourselves in. Uh, and so traditional economic theory is that when you have a recession, the government needs to step in and start taking up the slack. They need to add something to the economy. So that's the background for action. Right? And so there was an argument late last year for a stimulus in the range of 1.2 to 1.8 trillion dollars. Okay, by the numbers. All right, so how did the various elements of the government respond? The Treasury had this bailout bill, we all know from late last year, where they essentially handed money over to banks. Uh, a lot of banks just failed, but some banks, especially the biggest banks, got government bailout of money to buoy their balance sheets, afraid people were afraid they were going to collapse. Uh, the money came without any strings attached in terms of salaries, compensation, or even loaning it out. I think the idea was that you're going to give the banks the money, and then they make new loans to help the economy get going to small business owners who ever needed them. No, the banks by and large took the money, said thank you, we really needed that, and we'll just put it back to our vault, and, We'll sit on it because of, because our balance sheet was like so awful. Um, so uh, you know, the bank's immediate collapse was prevented by by getting a lot of money. Although whether or not it was a good investment for uh, the people at large is um, is still unsure. The Fed did what it could do. It cut interest rates all the way to zero. Right? It kept brought them down, brought them down all the way to zero. Um, and then it had this kind of alphabet soup of lending facilities, again, to try to help banks out, to create liquidity. Its balance sheet more than doubled. Um, it was 870 billion before the crisis. It's now over two trillion. Um, and the composition changed before the Treasury held only about, you know, almost exclusively high quality securities and now lots of short term credit from, <coughs> from commercial entities are in the Fed's balance sheet. So it's done what it can to step in and help the banks out. Um, and then, you know, it turns out that wasn't enough. If you remember that history of recessions that we looked at from the beginning, uh, there had come to be a rule, which is when the recession hits, the Fed should step in with monetary policy. So they should cut interest rates and help stimulate the economy, especially in recessions like the one we had in the early 80s, which was caused by the Fed raising interest rates to try to squeeze inflation out of the system. 
You then lower rates, and sure enough, the economy bounced back. We haven't faced for a long time the question of what do you do when interest rates go to zero and there's still this gap, this output gap to fill. When that isn't enough, when the recession is so huge that more action is needed. And so that's the genesis of uh, the stimulus bill passed early this year, uh, which was $787 billion to be paid out over uh, the next few years. About a third of it in tax cuts, split evenly between incentives for businesses and individuals. And this was, of course, mainly a sop to Republicans because they were pushing tax cuts, even though that's not the greatest way to stimulate the economy. Uh, nonetheless, there was a lot of tax cuts in there, and then lots of kinds of appropriations there. So things the government was doing anyway, it did more of them. Infrastructure kind of projects, research and development, and so on, highways. Do them now. Uh, move them up and try to get money into the economy. So here's a kind of <coughs> pictogram of the different elements of the, of the stimulus bill. You see tax relief is, is definitely the biggest. A lot of money went to state and local entities, infrastructure and science and such. So that's the elements of the stimulus bill. So this is how we do evaluate this. This is what the government needs to do in these situations. It has to do whatever it can to step in and not let things fall apart. If you have any critics, so for instance, our latest figures indicate that the stimulus package is adding three to four percent annually to GDP, and our last quarter was three and a half percent growth. So any growth we have right now is essentially due to the stimulus. Okay. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that the stimulus bill has had about its highest impact in you know, quarter 309. It's going to be going down after that. So we'll continue to get more out of them, um, but there's we are not done yet. So, so there's an argument now to be made that what we need is more of the same, especially to state governments. States have balanced budget requirements, just most states do, and so we have the problem what's called 50 Hoover's that when the recession hit, you know, government should be spending more, but all the state governments had to spend less. Right? In fact. The amount of increase in federal government spending just barely offset all the decreases in state level government spending. So they're firing people, laying off teachers, uh, and, you know, lots of workers. Uh, there's a very good argument to be made, just hand more money to state and local governments and let them you know, rehire and not fire people if they were firing anyway. So do more of that. Uh, I'm less confident that they've been aggressive enough with regard to the banks. Uh, there is this uh, huge surplus now. These, these are excess reserves in banks. And it, this is in you know, billions of dollars. And it's an amazing time series. If you look at it, it's like you know, half a billion, one billion, two, three, four, three, four, five. And it kind of hits 19, and it goes back to three, four, five. And then it goes like 60, 100, 600. Now it's almost a trillion dollars in excess reserves. That means the banks used to get basically take money in and lend it back out. They didn't have very much sitting around in their vaults. Now, because they have so many losses from all the time when they were overspending, they're taking all this money and just holding it in their vaults. They are not lending it out. So whatever you hear about they're making money, it's not because they're actually doing anything to help the economy. So the administration's idea here seems to be to wait for the economy to, make, to bail the banks out. If the economy is going to do so well that finally the banks will start lending and they'll do better rather than vice versa, rather than have the banks be an integral part of what's happening, uh, which is a stance that I'm not incredibly happy with, and I would like to have seen them put more conditions on the loans and the money originally. Uh, they're being a little bit aggressive now on, on pay, but that's, you know, that'll make us feel good, but it's not necessarily going to get money out circulating in the economy where it's really needed. Uh, so I think the bottom line is that the administration has followed standard economic theory. It's worked to the extent that they've been able to do something. Uh, there is more to do. I think that we are now in the, quote, jobless recovery. We're officially with positive growth, but as you know, we're still having job losses. And unfortunately, that's been the trend over the last 20 years and more, that you end the recession, but jobs don't bounce back for three, four, five, six quarters. So I would actually like to see the government do more now, but I think on, uh, on any uh, balance sheet, you'd have to say that the economy, that the administration so far gets high marks. Am I on here? 
Well, I guess I can agree on one thing there. I, I guess if you want to give the administration high marks for following standard economic theory, I guess they, they do got high marks for that. The problem is the theory is all wrong. The theory that they're following is Keynesianism, I mean, and, and that's why we're in so much trouble. The economy would be much better off if we veered from that uh, uh, standard economic theory. But before I actually uh, make my little presentation, I made some notes of some of the things David said. The one in particular struck me when he was explaining uh, the problems in the mortgage market and the structured products, and he mentioned that no, nobody noticed the problem. Well, I beg to differ. I mean, I, I noticed the problem quite, uh, quite sharply. <laughs> I wrote an entire book about the problem. Uh, I went around the country speaking about the problem. In fact, I actually specifically went to mortgage industry. I spoke for realtors and mortgage associations, specifically laying out the problem in the structured market and why the whole thing was going to collapse. So it didn't surprise me when it happened. I mean, I, it, I was expecting it to happen. Everything happened um, the way I thought it would. And, and the reason for that is because I understood how standard economic theory was destroying uh, the economy. <coughs> the, the topic that we're going to discuss is whether Barack Obama's plan is going to work. And I guess if by work, or I guess if his plan is to completely destroy what's left of the U.S. economy, then I guess it's going to work. But, you know, if, if, if we're looking for any kind of lasting uh, prosperity or solutions, the chances of it working are zero. And the reason I know the chance is zero is because we've already tried it before. And we've seen the consequences. We've seen the results. It was a disaster. Uh, Barack Obama's policy is Bush's policy. It's the same thing. Now, there's a difference in scale. <clears throat> Obama is doing it larger. It's bigger. So he's making bigger mistakes than Bush. But they're the same mistakes. And it's not just uh, you know, Obama. He's got a partner in crime at the Fed. He's got Ben Bernanke. It's a dynamic duo. The same thing you had uh, with Bush and Greenspan. And they're doing the same thing. So let's, before we talk about this current crisis, Let's look at the, the one that preceded it, the one that George Bush inherited. He, he stepped into a busted asset bubble. This time it was the stock market. And also briefly, David mentioned that the Great Depression was caused by a busted asset bubble. It wasn't. The busted asset bubble is what set the process into motion. But it wouldn't have been a Great Depression if the government hadn't intervened in the market, both under Hoover and Roosevelt, it was government interference in the aftermath of the bursting of that bubble that created the depression. Now anyway, let's look at what happened uh, in 2000. We had an asset bubble created by cheap money. This time it was in stocks. And ultimately the bubble burst around 2000. And when that happened, a recession ensued. Now, the reason you need a recession is because during the boom, people do a lot of very foolish things. Right? They make investments that they should, never should have made. I mean, think about all the crazy dot-com companies that came into existence during the late 1990s. Companies that never had a prayer of making money, yet there they were, occupying uh, rental property, employing people. I mean, all of this came to an end when you know, we sobered up. Right? You never, I, I often use the analogy when George Bush said that, uh, when he talked about the housing market, he said that America was, you know, that Wall Street got drunk. And I always say, sure, Wall Street was drunk, Main Street was drunk, the whole country was drunk. But they were drunk because the Fed liquored them up. And when you're, when you're drunk on cheap money, you do a lot of stupid things, like investing you know, in DrCoop.com or Pets.com or all kinds of crazy things. But when they took away that cheap money and we all sobered up, we realized you know, the mistakes that we made. And there's a recession. People who are working for these dot-coms lose their jobs. People who thought they had a lot of money in stock options and internet stocks lost that money. They have to cut back on their spending because they weren't as rich as they thought they were. So we were going to have a recession. But George Bush comes in and he doesn't want a recession. He just got there. Everything was great under, under Clinton. I don't want a recession when I'm here. So he thinks, well, what can we do? Ah, oh, standard Keynesian theory. Let's stimulate. Let's run up deficits. And so they cut, they cut some taxes, they increase government spending, they start running deficits to spend money. And uh, Greenspan slashed interest rates down to 1%. That was their solution. Stimulate our way out of this mess, right? Well, they stimulated us out of that recession into this much greater one that we're in now. 
And because what did they do? They created the housing bubble. There would have been no housing bubble without the Fed. It would have been impossible. It couldn't have been financed. There would have never been a teaser rate. The whole teaser rates became because of the Fed 1% Fed funds rates. That's where it all came from. It wouldn't have existed without that cheap money. So we, we, we blew the air into that bubble. But the administration loved it because it kept us spending. The reason that he had that chart up there, David had that chart and showed how shallow that recession was, that, that shallow recession was part of the problem. It needed to be a lot deeper. It wasn't because we you know, shot it up with all that government heroin, all that morphine, that, that cheap money. And so we inflated this housing bubble and we enabled consumers to spend money they didn't have. We, we spent trillions of dollars we didn't have. We bought all kinds of stuff we didn't make. And we were living in a delusional state. It was a bubble economy. All of the growth that we thought we had between 2002 and 2007, it, wasn't a, it was an illusion. It was a mirage. It wasn't real. We just spent borrowed money. And we went deep into debt. And we polluted all of our financial institutions with these toxic assets. It was a ticking time bomb. And ultimately, it went off. And now, you know, the bubble bursts again. And since we had a bigger asset bubble because of the Bush Greenspan stimulus, now we have an even bigger bust because we made even more stupid mistakes uh, during the real estate bubble than we did during the stock market bubble because it was on a bigger scale. More Americans participated in the housing bubble than the stock market bubble. And when people were buying stocks, they pretty much did it with their own money. When people bought houses, they did it with other people's money. There was massive leverage involved. So when the stock market bubble burst, it was the people that bought stocks that lost. When it was the housing bubble, the entire economy, because the whole banking system financed the whole thing. And of course, you know, some of the reasons that they were so quick to do it was because you had Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that were guaranteeing all the mortgages. So the government was trying to take the risk out of mortgage lending so that lenders wouldn't care about the risks of, of not being paid back. It was all this moral hazard and cheap money that laid the foundation that made it possible. But during that time period where Americans thought they were richer than they were, they behaved irrationally. Americans went out and bought things they couldn't afford. They bought cars, they bought second cars, they bought vacation homes, they bought plasma TVs, and they put them in every room, they remodeled their kitchens, they got you know, granite countertops, they put in you know, jacuzzi bathtubs. Everybody was spending money. We bought all kinds of electronic gizmos. But uh, under normal circumstances, nobody would have spent all that money if they didn't think they had all this housing wealth. And it wasn't just the housing wealth they already had. People were extrapolating these rising home prices indefinitely into the future. So everybody that lived in a house just figured they just struck it rich. The whole country acted like they won the lottery. And so we all were spending money. Well, reality set in ultimately when housing prices went down. And now we're sobering up, right, from all that government alcohol. And so what do we have to do? Well, gee, we spent too much money. We've got to stop spending. I need to rebuild. People have to rebuild their savings. they got nothing left. I was relying on home equity and ever-increasing stock prices. I better start saving my money. And, and so consumers stop spending. A lot of people are employed in businesses that were dependent on that spending, whether people working in home improvement, uh, realtors, people working at Home Depot, people working at all sorts of companies where the only reason they were able to sell things is because people thought they had more money than they had. So these people have to lose their jobs. So we need a severe recession. And I'm saying we need the recession because we've got a lot of mistakes. Right? The boom, the artificial boom that you have when you have government interference in the money supply and with interest rates, that boom is a disease. That's what sickens the economy. It's during the recession where the market tries to right itself, tries to get rid of those toxins and, and, and reestablish a healthy economy. The problem is the bigger the boom, the, the bigger the, the, the disease, the, the more difficult it is uh, for the problems to be corrected. So we started off in this recession with a lot of problems. We needed a lot of work to do. And now you have Barack Obama coming into office, just like, just like George Bush, right? He is inheriting a busted asset bubble and a recession that he didn't cause. He was, I mean, he was in the Senate, so I guess he was part of the problem. But, <laughs> you know, he walked into it just like Bush. And what does he want to do? Does he want to level with the American public and say, you know what? We were living in a fantasy economy before I got here. 
we were spending too much, we were borrowing too much, home prices were too high, that we're going to have to suck it up and we're going to have to pay for all those mistakes? No. He did the exact same thing as Bush. Let's stimulate. Let's postpone the pain. Let's not let the market work. So under Bush, we brought interest rates to 1%. Well, now we brought them to zero. Zero. I mean, look at all the damage we did with 1%. Imagine what we're going to get with zero. And Bush's deficits, I mean, 300 billion, what were they, 300 billion, the last 400 billion? Now we're, now we're doing over a trillion, a trillion and a half, two trillion a year. And that's before we had health care and cap and trade and whatever else they're trying to throw at us. So we're talking about going off the charts. And, and so if you can if you think about the, 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 the effects of the Bush oh, oh, a Greenspan stimulus, the, the, the havoc that that you know, wrought on our economy, the collapse of all these banks, you know, this the worst recession since the Great Depression, and that is the result of the stimulus under under Bush and Greenspan. Imagine the result of this stimulus, because it's way bigger, right? So the bust is going to be much much worse, and I think the way it's going to play out, the last crisis, the crisis that we just <coughs> left, or you know, was a financial crisis. The coming crisis that's going to start in a year or two is a currency crisis, which is going to be much, much worse than the financial crisis. And the currency crisis is brought on by a collapse in the value of our money. Why is the value of the dollar going to collapse? Because we're printing so many of them. We are printing way too many dollars. We're printing dollars to, to uh, prop up businesses, to keep Americans spending, when the real thing is we don't want Americans to spend. They spend too much. The only way we can have a real recovery is if Americans stop spending and we have a recession. We need to repair our balance sheets personally. We need a lot more savings. We need a savings rate of maybe 10 or 15%. And we need to keep it there for a generation. <coughs> because economies grow because you save. Because savings enables capital investment. And capital investment enables production and employment and all the things that we want and all the economic growth. Savings is where it starts. And so that's what we have to do. But unfortunately, we have to transition from this phony bubble economy brought on by cheap money to a sustainable economy. And there are some growing pains. There's transitional unemployment. There's a lot of things that have to happen uh, to, to readjust. But if we want to try to, for political reasons, try to deny reality and pretend that the solution is to go deeper into debt, that we should just try to get Americans to buy more cars and buy more houses when we already bankrupted our country because people bought cars and houses that they couldn't afford and now we're trying to get them to buy even more, we're creating a bigger problem. We're, we're, we're giving alcohol to a drunk and we hope that it's going to sober him up. It's not. And so what happens is we create all this money and now the dollar collapses. And in the financial crisis, what politicians were worried about was people losing money. People having money in a money market and the money market breaks a buck and now they lose some of their money. Or people, their house goes down, they lose their home equity, their stocks go down, a bank fails. So it's all about losing money. Okay, the government's now fixed it, so we're not gonna lose any money. We can all go like this, no one's gonna lose any money. But the problem is the money's gonna lose its value. And that's worse, because the government can't make losses go away. The government doesn't have any money, the government doesn't have any wealth, right? When David is talking about the government should give money to the states, what money? The government doesn't have any money. It has a printing press. That's all it has. And when it prints money, it destroys its value. It's, 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 it's spending purchasing power that already exists in its circulation, but it's spending it on things it wants, and so you can't spend it on things you want. And so when the dollar collapses in value, all of a sudden, it's not, you know, the losses are, are, are going in terms of purchasing power. We, we blew trillions and trillions of dollars. These are real losses, right? People bought houses. They are never gonna pay that money back. They spent the money. They bought all, look around, all the stuff that we've been buying, all the stuff that Walmart had on the shelves, all, look at your neighbor's garage, driveway, look at all this stuff. We bought all that stuff. We, can't, we don't have the money to pay for it, we never did. So the, it's, it's a huge loss, it can't come back. And so the dollar's gonna collapse. And what's, what happens then? So the dollar collapses, and then prices just go ballistic for consumer goods. The prices that will go up first will be the most basic commodity type things that are readily exchangeable around the world, uh, such as food and energy. So people are going to start to see oil prices going up, not just to $4 a gallon like we saw last time, but $10 a gallon, $20 a gallon. And it's not just going to be oil. 
It's going to be milk, it's going to be bread, it's going to be corn, it's going to be basic commodities that are going to get very expensive. And then ultimately what's going to happen is other currencies around the world who have been loading up on dollars and, 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 and pegging their currencies to the dollar, they're going to depeg because they're going to be under too much pressure to print too much money. There's no way that China can keep printing RMB at the rate they are. Uh, they're going to have to stop. And of course, if they stop, they have to let their currency go up. And so they will depeg, and the, the Middle East will depeg, and many countries will depeg. And then it's not just going to be food and energy that's going to go up. You know, it's going to be everything. It's going to be all the, uh, the, the clothing, all the products that are coming in from China that are so inexpensive. The rest of the world, all of a sudden, you know, going to, um, going to uh, Walmart will be going to Neiman Markets. You know, it's going to be, you know, so Americans are going to, they're not going to be able to spend. Their money's not going to have any value. So sure, you're going to go to the bank and your money's still going to be there because the government bailed out the bank by printing money. But when you go and take your money out of the bank and you can't buy anything with it because the prices have gone up so much, it's the same uh, I I impact. But it's not just prices for goods that are going to go up. Prices for money are going to go up. Ultimately, interest rates are going to head skyward as well. Long-term interest rates are going to take off. And if people think, the housing market is bad now, wait till you can't even get a loan to buy a house. Wait till it's an all-cash market, because interest rates are so high, you know, you can only buy a house if you have cash. How low are prices going to have to be when, you know, you have to pay 100%? And forget about a down payment, I mean, you have to buy the house. So we're going to see, you know, double-digit interest rates, double-digit inflation, double-digit unemployment. Unemployment is going to keep going worse. We're never going to get meaningful job growth unless the government gets out of the way and lets the economy restructure. If they keep trying to reflate this bubble, we're going to keep losing jobs. And you know, the real unemployment rate is about 17.5% when you count the people who are uh, settling for part-time work or who are discouraged and giving up. I mean, that figure is going to be well north of 20% by the time Barack Obama is, is up for re-election. And the problem is, the Fed is going to have, you know, the, it, the last chance to do the right thing. You know, sometime in the next year or two, the Fed is going to have a chance to finally do what it hasn't done, and that is defend the dollar and substantially increase interest rates. And it's going to have to do it despite the fact that we're still in a deep recession, that unemployment is still high, and housing, it's going to have to do it anyway. And it's going to have to raise interest rates extremely high, and when they do that, Right? The housing market will, will, will plunge again, and every single financial institution that was bailed out will fail again. And the government has to let them fail the, the next time. They have to not bail them out a second time. They have to let them fail and let them go bankrupt. Now, I don't think they're going to do that. I mean, to be, I, I don't think there's any honesty in Washington at all for that. I think that just to buy one more election cycle, they will just you know, make a deal with the devil. And in effect, that's what they're doing. So if they put the pressure on the Fed. They've already got, you know, um, Chris Dodd has already got this new, you know, this new plan he announced yesterday, you know, to uh, strip the Fed of its powers, which I think is kind of ridiculous because they're stripping the Fed of powers it never even had in the first place. It usurped <laughs> these powers. And so rather than admonishing the Fed, they're going to take these powers that never existed and then formally uh, give them to, to new federal agencies that will abuse these powers even more than the Fed did. You know, and so the economy is going to come under much more uh, uh, trouble when you, when you take these powers and give them to uh, uh, politically, more politically accountable organizations uh, than, than the Fed. So I don't think they're going to do that. I think they're going to keep on reaching for Bernanke's printing press. They're going to continue to, to pursue, as David said, the standard uh, economic theory, which hopefully will be completely discredited and bankrupted and never taught again as a result of what's going to happen to the American economy. I mean, maybe our misery can at least, you know, help out some other countries so they don't have to follow us down this pathway. But they will keep trying to get government spending. Yeah, you know, they keep looking at, you know, that, you know, that, that, that formula, you know, C plus I plus G, as if government spending is the same thing as investment spending, as if companies stop spending. And the government just spent the difference. It's, 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 all, it's all the same. It's all, as long as it's in the GDP, you know, it's, they, all they can do is print money. I mean, it doesn't mean anything if they, if they do that. So they're going to keep thinking that we need to spend, and so give consumers money to spend, and they don't understand that that's why we're in trouble. They will keep stimulating this economy until it dies of an overdose of stimulus. Because they don't understand, Barack Obama doesn't understand, and George Bush doesn't understand, that the stimulus is the problem. And the more they stimulate the economy, the worse the economy gets. Because the stimulus is toxic. It's, the stimulus is why the economy is sick. Now, sure, when they stimulated initially, 
you know, the symptoms appear to be arrested for a little bit because you get a little bit of a phony high. You know, just like, you know, if you're a football player and you're injured and then, you know, you have a bad leg and so you shoot it up with some of this morphine or something it puts, and now you can play because you don't feel it. And you don't think you're doing any damage, but meanwhile you're doing a lot of damage. You just don't know because of the drug. That's what's going on. You, need, you, you put the stimulus into the economy and then you feel better because people take the borrowed money and go out and spend it. And you pretend that that spending is real GDP growth when it's not. And then when the stimulus wears off and you're left with a, with a bigger mess, right? We are in a much bigger hole today than we were uh, when, when, when uh, Barack Obama inherited the problem. So I think, to, to, to draw the comparison to the 30s, Herbert, uh, uh, George Bush was this generation's Herbert Hoover, and unfortunately, uh, Barack Obama is Roosevelt. And rather than you know, creating a Great Depression, this time we can end up creating the greatest depression. It will be an inflationary depression, maybe even a hyperinflationary depression. And the problem is that the, the economy that, that uh, Roosevelt inherited was fundamentally sounder than the one we have today. Uh, we had a much higher savings rate, we were much more industrious, so we didn't have all this debt. We had a tiny federal government. Uh, Roosevelt expanded the government, but it was tiny. I mean, nobody really paid any taxes back then anyway. I mean, when Roosevelt came in, I mean, no one paid income taxes. The, in the income tax came in in 1913, but only the super rich paid it. And then it was like 1%, 2%, I mean, it was nothing. There were no payroll taxes, no social security taxes. So the average American worker, he kept everything here, and he kept 100%. The only taxes he had were some duties, you know, on, on some imported products. Other than that, you know, it was pretty much tax-free. So when Roosevelt came in and added some stuff, I mean, it was, it was, it was tiny. It was still, it was a bad precedent that he set, and the things that he did were enough to screw up the economy that, you know, it, prevent, it prevented the, the free market from uh, correcting the depression quickly. But today, it's a different story. We're already taxed, you know, we have a heavy government burden on the average American. The government is enormous. We're now talking about, what, a $3 trillion plus the budget. We're borrowing like crazy. We're the world's biggest debtor nation. We have those savings. And we have, well, I got it right, and we have this phony economy that's built on a service, service sector and consumer spending, which can't exist because it only exists as long as the world lends us the money to buy stuff and ships us the stuff to buy. Because without the world producing, we have nothing to buy, and without the world lending, we have nothing to spend. Anyway, I guess I'm out of time for about 15 minutes. <laughs> It's on, it's on. Yeah, it's fine. Do I still have this thing? Am I on twice? That's good for a minute there. We wouldn't have anything to argue with. First of all, there's this notion going around of anthropomorphizing the economy. So it's an organism with a disease that needs to be cured. Or there's this kind of uh, binge and purge idea. It's like a teenager who's just been at a party too long and is drunk too much and needs to get it out of the system. Uh, the economy is not an animal. We don't have a virus or a disease. The economy is a lot of people. It's resources who can get put together to create value or not. Uh, a recession happens when people, when resources lie idle, when people who want to work aren't working, when money that could be lent to businesses who want to use it isn't being lent. That's what we have now. There is nothing morally redeeming or uh, helpful about letting this go on. There's nothing about getting it out of our system that's good. It's just a terrible state for people. They're losing money, they're losing their dreams, they're losing their homes. And there's no reason why the government should sit idly by and say, you know, I'm sorry, I wish I could help you, but you'll just, you know, binge again, and my gosh, you need to be taught a lesson, so, you know, wait, you know, what was it, five, 10, 15 years until maybe it's worked out of your system, then you can work again. I, that's, you know, the, that's where economics goes down the wrong road is when you're trying to anthropomorphize what's going on. It's, it's a simple problem. You need to get people to work. We have underutilized resources in the economy. We're way below efficiency. There's absolutely no reason not to step in. Can I say something just about that? Back well, you want to go back and forth? Oh, I think so. Well, I think what the point you're missing on, on what a recession is, it's not that resources are idle. Well, that's my definition. No, well, well, your definition is not quite the actual definition. 
but what's happening, what's happening during a recession is that resources that were misallocated during the boom are being reallocated. So it's not that they're just idle. You have capacity that was inefficient. You had when, let's say, during the, the, the tech bubble, when all of a sudden there was a company that was going to, a dot-com company came into existence during the, the recession when it folds because it, it was utilized. It's just transitionary. I understand that. Yeah, but this isn't a matter of like people who are building houses in Nevada and need to go somewhere else. Yes, there's some reallocation. But that isn't what's going on for most of the economy. Well, we built some people who are in a bad economy. But bad together remember, we built too many houses. We have to stop building houses. That's right, That's but it's easy enough. But those people who are formerly building houses, who says they should have to sit at home for a year? But they won't. Eventually they'll do no, something. But the government is trying help. to keep them in the housing market. No. We're subsi no, no, no. Sure we are. We're subsidizing people to buy and houses. We're giving out tax credits. We're keeping interest rates too low so people can buy houses. We just saw all the numbers. The housing market is tanked. I assure you. But they're still building them. No, not, not at the rate that we're... But why are they building, building them at all? We got to They do we need to do it. Well, but let's, well, interest rates there's lots, My no. point is that there's lots of people who have been building houses who have now stopped building houses Good. because the mouth part is tanked. But there's no reason to say, and because you were doing the wrong thing for so many years, you have to sit at home for a year or two. They won't. Or they, they're not going to be there That's that long. That's what's happening in a recession. Because, the, 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 no, because the government is not letting the economy restructure. They're not letting That's resources. Not no, resources have to be efficient re, re, reallocated. What we need to do, we need people making things, we need the manufacturing to build stuff, but none of that's going to happen if we keep interest rates at zero. None of that's going to happen if we keep trying to prop up the industries like in the financial service industry. A lot of these firms need to fail. We, 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 don't, we can't have them. I, I, have zero, I have zero argument with you about the financial services industries. I think there's a lot of firms there that have you know, taken people's money for a long time, and there's firms there and individuals there that need to fail. I have no argument there. But for the real economy, uh, it isn't the fact that right now, you know, if you look at the government plan there, it wasn't like, you know, $700 billion for housing. It's all over the economy. The, the, the housing market is tanking. The what do you is, think the low interest rates are for? The 0% the, the, the interest rates are to prop up housing and prop no, up banks. 0% interest rates props up anyone who wants a loan. Right. Anyone who wants to go... No, not anyone. A small businessman isn't getting any of that. Money. Well, that's a problem. That there's no money around. No, because I mean, no, but there's no money for that, and and the government is borrowing all the money. Isn't just sitting there; it's going into treasuries. We're having we things financing deficit. The banks are sitting on a trillion dollars worth of reserves, so it's not going anywhere. Or you say it's going to. But yeah. it's not being lent out in the economy. Because they're lending it to the government. They can't lend it to the government and the economy. It's called crowding out. I mean, there's only one. They can only lend to one person at a time. No, the government's okay. borrowing a lot. I'm going to intervene. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I like this. Uh, I see that you've got a list of a variety of points. Uh, why don't we see if we can go more or less point by point? Uh, <laughs> we have plenty of time. Okay. Ready to go. So A is, there's nothing morally redemptive or useful about having people out of work. The government can do something to get resources used now, borrowing money to do it. It's worthwhile. It's worthwhile for the entire economy. Second of all, I think Peter is much more of a, of a Keynesian than he would let off. He admits that it's true that when the government follows stimulative pro uh, policies, especially monetary stimulus, it works. That is, in fact, what happened. It works. And that's, in fact, what happened in the 2001 recession. It worked, and we had a shallow recession. Now, the problem was, you know, it isn't like, oh, there's 2000, 2001, 2008, oh, they're still doing the same thing. They had lots of chances and to, after the recession ended, before 2008, to stop the easy money policy. And there I'm a critic, like you, of the government of saying, why, would, why was Greenspan keeping interest rates so low 2002, 3, 4, 5, all those years where the idea was specifically to stimulate housing. They thought getting people into houses was a great idea, and they overstimulated the economy. That's, that's led to this. So again, that's Keynesian logic, but it's it's a misuse of the, of the government's power. The idea is that you, you know, yeah, step one, there's a recession, easy monetary policy. You do whatever you can to get the economy back on its feet. Step two, the economy recovers, you raise interest rates again, right? You keep inflation down, you get it back to normal levels. The problem, and the, the problem though, right, is that at any point that Greenspan had started, if he had raised interest rates more aggressively, we just would have had the recession sooner. It no, wouldn't have been bad. 
He and knew. He knew that he was propping up no, no, no. the economy, and he was reluctant no. to take away the problem. The point was not that. He thought, oh, no, we're going to hit a recession. <laughs> No, no, the, back to my but no, the, the idea is that you could have raised interest rates easily in the middle of the decade and you wouldn't have hit a recession, just the economy would toot all along. You know, the, it wouldn't have been as great. I mean, the real fundamental problems in the economy because a lot of the money was going to the richest 1%, 1.5%, whatever. So it's true. I think, had consumers not felt as good about their housing prices, that would have been something to face, but it wouldn't have brought on a recession. Uh, so the idea is that you have to follow the Keynesian recipe all the way through, and that indeed it took a lot of actors to create the crisis that we had last year, of which the Fed was one. I have to agree there that it took, you know, the Fed pushing low interest rates and all the banks misbehaving and the mortgage lenders and people, you know, willingly or not to wait for any plan to what happened. But there's no reason to think that properly used traditional economic policy would fail down. It's, it's done well in the past. We've built up this consensus over the past quarter century, and you saw we had shallow recessions. We had lots of inflation at the end of the 70s. The Fed raised, uh, raised interest rates in order to bring that out of the system, then lower them and stimulate the economy. It's really not rocket science. It's worked before. Uh, and this notion that we're somehow hurtling towards disaster now uh, is, I think, overdoing. It, it is true that you have to worry a lot more now about the dollar, about future debts, about inflation later on, because we're in a position we haven't been in for a long, long time. Uh, but you know, there are markets for these things. If we believe in markets, we should be looking at long-term Fed rates, and they're remaining solid. Nobody thinks yet that the U.S. is on the way towards defaulting on the debt. Our debt as a percent of GDP is still less than it was during World War II. So it wasn't like there were tight money policies back then. We were spending more then than now. Uh, and that's what we need to get ourselves out of the slum. Uh, so I, I agree you have to keep your eye on those. Uh, and indeed, after we really start coming out of the recession, we will have to raise interest rates and all that. Uh, but I don't see a collapse in U.S. standards, in U.S. living standards coming. It's, I think it can be managed. What I see, uh, not necessarily Peter, but you know, the Republicans in general saying is uh, it's similar to they were driving a car heading us straight towards a cliff, the you know, brink of a cliff. We were going to fall over the cliff. They've been driving us there at full speed. Uh, the, uh, the voters say, you know, I think I want someone else to drive. The Democrats come in, the Republicans get in the, you know, the back seat, and, the, and, the, and they immediately say, you know, you seem to be swerving a lot. You know, what is all this funny thing you're doing about it with all this spending? Well, that's what the Democrats have to do because we were heading towards disaster. They did whatever they could to, to avert it, which means spending a lot more than they ever wanted to. I think Obama said these words when he came in. I didn't plan on the first thing being a seven hundred billion dollars spending bill, but that's what it took. And you know, once again, they're getting it wrong. You need to spend now to get out of trouble. And then you know, we do have to worry about inflation. But in a way, that is tomorrow's work. Today's worry is the incredible recession over ten percent of employment. Peter, do you have a response to that? <laughs> <laughs> you spent our way into trouble. We're not going to spend our way out. We can only save our way out. Uh, you know, the problem with Obama is he's not just swerving. He stepped on the gas, and we're just going to go off that cliff uh, even sooner because of what he's done. You know, when you talk about the deficits that we had to finance the Second World War, we self-financed that. The government sold war bonds to Americans who had savings. We're financing these deficits from China, Japan, from Russia, from Saudi Arabia, from Brazil. Plus, back then, our economy was more sustainable because it was industrial. We manufactured, we produced, we were a large exporter. And now we have a huge trade deficit. We we're basically bankrupted. And while the expenditures during the Second World War were temporary, they ended when the war ended. These expenditures are going on in perpetuity. <laughs> so it is a huge, huge difference, and we are extremely vulnerable. And I know, David, you mentioned you, know, you don't see a collapse coming. Did you see the collapse coming that we just had, the 2000 yeah. housing collapse? Did I say the housing prices were falling? But did, did, you, did you see the bankruptcy of a lot of the banks and the financial institutions? Did you, did you, did you predict that Freddie and Fannie would go bankrupt? Did you see all this all this stuff coming? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I had a position on uh, But did you see the worst recession since the Great Depression? I saw I saw a real bad housing bubble about to burst. I didn't know it would be all right. this bad. All right, well, right. well, okay, then you saw something. But I was like, a lot of people didn't see that disaster coming. And they don't see this next one coming. I saw that coming with crystal clarity. I mean, I laid it out precisely. I mean, 
mean, I didn't miss anything. I got it in, in vivid detail. <laughs> and I can tell you that from that perspective, we are, you know, we are on the verge of something far greater, a much bigger disaster than what we've experienced. Because the government, as I said, the government hasn't solved any of these problems. They simply compounded them and postponed the consequences for a couple of years. The idea, when, when, when David was saying, I agree that the stimulus worked, it worked in a sense that, you know, it, taking heroin works for a drug, a drug addict. I mean, you, the analogy. Well, just analogies we're, not all, we're not all on drugs. <laughs> you know, if, somebody, if somebody is going through a withdrawal, and then they find some more heroin, okay, it works, right? The withdrawal symptoms go away. But they're not solving the problem, because now they're still addicted to the drug. Yes. The stimulus the money in jobs. It's not that's not real money. The drug the drug was spending don't have real money. Like, we can't have an economy based on spending. The economy is based on production and saving. Our economy is phony. We're, we're spending too much, we're not saving. And every time the economy tries to adjust to that reality, every time consumers start to save a little bit more money, the government hates that because they spend less and now the economy turns down. And so when they try to stimulate it, they try to encourage us to do the bad behavior that the market is trying to correct. And yes, we had a very shallow recession, unfortunately, and the price for that shallow recession was the disaster of 2008. Had we allowed the market to function and to reallocate resources better, we would not be in this predicament. What is, the, what is wrong with the U.S. economy right now? Why doesn't it function? Why are these resources uh, misallocated? Asset prices are too high. Housing prices are still much too high that they need to come down. Stock prices are too high. They need to come down. Too many people are working in the service sector. They need to stop doing that. We don't have enough people working in, in goods production. They need to migrate over there. People are spending too much money. That has to stop. They have to save more money. What do we need for that? We need higher interest rates. So we need higher interest rates. We need lower asset prices. We need more people saving, less people spending, and of course we need less government regulation and things like that so that we can be more productive and more efficient. Those are the things that have to happen. And if they do happen, <clears throat> the economy will recover. Unfortunately, we have a lot of problems that we have to digest first. You know, you're talking about, you know, the government has to do something. You know, we had a, a depression that nobody knows about in, in, in 1920. We had a collapse of the stock market and GDP that was even greater than the collapse in 1929. But because the government didn't do anything, it was over before anybody knew about it. It's only when the government interferes in the market and refuses to allow prices to adjust and markets to a function, a function efficiently that you get this disaster. If that were true, there wouldn't be any such thing as a recession. No, well, if, if yes. The, the Great Depression was this long, terrible, grinding recession. We keep having this because of the recession. government, because of Roosevelt. No, they don't correct themselves. They, they don't correct themselves. Do. And remember, the root, cause, the, root, the root cause is the government. Remember, the recession is where the mistakes are corrected. It's the booms where they're made. It's the phony booms that make recessions necessary. And it's governments that turn recessions into depressions. And this government's going to turn a depression into a hyperinflationary depression. That's the real problem. And that's coming. It's coming in a few years. So it's not even going to be a debate. It's going to be history. <laughs> I mean, look, do you, think, uh, I'll, I'll do you think it's an accident the price of gold did a record high today? Do you think it's an accident the dollar just hit a new low for the year? And look, do you think it's an accident that the Bank of India just bought 200 metric tons of gold that central banks around the world want out of their dollars? And again, on dollar price, look, the dollar went shot up last year when everybody in the world was freaking out and bought dollars as a safety thing. So the fact that it's falling now is mainly because people are less worried that we're going to have a global collapse. Yeah, but and, and by the way, the fact that dollars falling it has offsetting effects. It isn't like we're all poorer. Yes, it is. No, well, well, not me because I own gold and I have hard money. But most Americans are a lot poor. No, when no, your no, currency yeah. loses value, you lose purchasing power. Yes, but you also get to export more. That means your goods and services and your work doesn't trade down. Yes. Yeah, so, well, how about well, how about export? Well, how about how about more well, well, than we used to? Well, where do you work at a university? Absolutely. Why don't they? Would you watch? Would, would you be better off if they did you just cut your pay? Or cut your pay in half? Because you'd be exporting. You can export more of your professor services if you just charge less. So why don't you take a pay cut and then you can, you know, you can work harder. Um, we don't want to get less for our exports. We want to get more for our exports. The economy as a whole doesn't rise or fall on the dollar. Sure it does. No, no, no. That's not a person. 
the what do you think we're spending? If you look over time at the dollar price, um, at the price of the dollar in GDP or any measure of wealth and income, there's no. No, but the GDP is all. That's not a. This is real so that's how like we're on this gold. Like the more, like the more gold we have, the richer we are. The less yeah. gold we have, the less. And gold, that's is, gold is real. That's, that's hey, like. So you think the more money we have? <laughs> so oh, so why is why is why aren't they, are they booming over there in Zimbabwe? They got they got trillion dollar bills. <laughs> But what's the difference? Like, where do you, where do you kind of... Where do you say what's hyper and what's All right, why doesn't the government... Give, like, okay, you want people to spend here? more. Why doesn't the government just put a check in the mail to every citizen for $10,000? Yay! That's a terrible thing to do because... That's why? Like, what's wrong with that? Because that's as bad as giving the banks the money. No, no, just for revenue. Because, because a lot of richer people will take that money and say, thanks a lot, you know, I really needed to save money for my kids' education. Okay, we won't I give it to the rich. You, like, you, you have to earn less than 50000 oh, right. we'll give you. Everybody 10000 put it in the Absolutely. Mouth. How about 100000 100000 Yeah, everybody under... Everybody under hundred thousand? Well, I'm worried. No, no. About let's people. give everybody who makes less than 50000 a $100,000. <laughs> Don't really spend. But with the condition that they yeah, have to spend I'm not sure people can unload $100,000. I think they could. I Let's just give everybody a million then. Hey, you know. Okay. Hey, hey, particular question. So a little bit of something is better more of it necessary. Part of what you two seem to be talking about is the possibility that there is some political difficulty in getting people to buck up and face the pain that is inevitable in the business cycle. And um, maybe this is not an economic question, but do, do people lose their commitment to capitalism if the uh, pain of the lower part of the business cycle turns out to be too much? And do we explain what happens in Washington just as a consequence of politicians trying to relieve that pain that I think yeah. uh, you're suggesting is inevitable? And I'm not sure, David, yeah. whether you're suggesting it's inevitable, but maybe that it can be uh, ignored. Uh, let, let's, let's start. Uh, let's start with David. <laughs> um, I think there is something very worse about the way that the people see the economy. I don't know if it has so much to do with the pain that you go through in a recession, uh, although obviously people like you know, don't like to be out of jobs, they don't like that economic times. They're more willing to think that though if they feel like we're all in this together. And what's happened the last few years has been this, or well, the last decade, and more, this you know, huge increase in inequality, and recently the feeling that there are some people who are profiting at others' expense, especially people downtown on Wall Street, people at the big banks. I think that's corrosive to society. I think that uh, people will not stand for a situation where they see themselves pitching in, doing their part, going through tough times, while the government is giving away free money to people who already have much more of it than they possibly need, and the people who got us into this in the first place. Yeah, I mean, that's one uh, thing that we do agree with on is that, you know, a lot of people are getting rich at the expense of other people. And in capitalism, and if we, ha if we were a capitalistic economy, this would not be happening. But under capitalism, you get rich uh, by helping other people. You provide them with goods and services at a quality at a price that they prefer, and you get rich by helping everybody else. Everybody gains in capital. <laughs> Unfortunately, in this you know fascist, socialist, whatever you want to call it, society we live in now, uh, Washington is helping Wall Street get rich off of everybody else's expense because when they create inflation, it's Wall Street that gets the money first. They're the ones that are the beneficiaries of all the cheap money. It gets funneled through the Wall Street investment banks, and they're able to speculate with that money. And when they make a lot of money, they keep the profits. And when they lose money, they get bailed out to speculate again. And then, and then they make, and so they keep this whole thing going. Meanwhile, the, the poor and the middle class are getting killed because their wages are losing value because of all this inflation. The cost of living is going up, and they're getting bled to death uh, by politicians and bankers. And the problem is, people think what they've got is capitalism, but they don't have it. And then they blame the problems on a system that doesn't exist. The problem is not capitalism, but that the government is interfering and not letting it function. We need to have market-based prices, not government-manipulated prices. That includes interest rates, need to be set by the market. Resources have to go where they're most efficient. When government interferes for political reasons, it causes resources to go places that they wouldn't otherwise go. And you have an inefficient allocation, and you, and you don't have Real, real production and real standard living growth. So we've cultivated this society, and unfortunately, you know, capitalism has got a bad name. I think the brand has been tarnished unfairly based on what has been practiced under that banner. And a lot of people look at George Bush and they think that he's capitalism and he's free markets. He's not. He's a big government guy. He's a 
Obama promises a change from capitalism, he's really promising more of Bush, but the public doesn't understand it. And I'm hoping that, you know, as the, as the situation gets worse and worse and worse, that they see these lies for what they are and understand that the only real salvation of our economy is going to be to re-embrace uh, those principles of free markets and capitalism and the things that the country used to stand for before our politicians destroyed it. But I know that you know when you're dealing uh, with voters in a democracy, that it's a lot easier to get elected if you promise somebody something for nothing. And I know that it's human nature to sometimes be jealous and envious, and you can see somebody who's more successful than you are, and if a politician promises to take some of his money and give it to you, a lot of times people will vote for that guy. And that's very unfortunate because it's that type of politics that has made this, this, this situation what it is. And our politicians who are there, these career politicians, they know what it takes to get reelected because that's all they care about. They don't give a damn about the country or what or what happens to it in the future. Their future is their reelection, and they know that they get elected by you know by promising uh, you know you know more drugs to the attic, and that's what they're going to do. I think until the public you know gets such a belly full of this stuff that they they just won't take it anymore. You, you can say a lot of things about the problems with the market, but. You can't say that it was a big government that was a problem with all the Wall Street firms absolutely the CDOs. Absolutely not. Yes. No. Well, you want me to explain how you did it? How no. Did it? Uh, let me <laughs> those, those were markets operating without very many controls. And so you want to say there's capitalism, then there's all the bad things. You define non-capitalism as anything that happens bad. I, my only statement is that financial markets, like any other market, needs to be well regulated. Well, the here, problem, one of the problems that happened in the mid part of this decade is that. You have lots of instruments that were not being looked over, not being regulated. They were being sold often fraudulently. You know, there was all kinds of problems happening. And you should see financial regulation not as anti-market, not as slowing things down, but as the understructure upon which markets are built. Okay, to 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 go over what happened in the housing bubble, and and, and I'm not saying that you know there are no entities. In, in the private sector that got you know drunk on the government alcohol and did stupid things, and we should have let them pay for it. Oh, we created the yeah, Yes, it was. So no, what, what, it's all the low number no, originators who were making money. No, no, no. Look, the middlemen were making money. Look, people in other countries making money. No, let, I'll explain it to you. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll explain it to you exactly what I did in 2005 and 2006, right before people understood. But. The, 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 the how, you have to look at how the bubble got started first. Okay, so it got started. There was no subprime market. There was no securitization market. There was just Freddie and Fannie. And in your initial, job, in your initial uh, chart up there, the way people used to buy houses is they would go to a bank, and they would borrow money, and the bank would lend it to them. And they were lending money that Americans had deposited there when we still saved money. So the banks had money because we had savings. And the banks loaned money to people, and of course they wanted to make sure they got paid back, because the real key to lending money is the getting paid back part. Right? That's the secret. <laughs> so in order to get paid back, they made sure that people put big down payments and that the people didn't borrow too much. But what happened is the government, you know, the government wanted to make it so people, you know, bank people could, you know, buy houses without really, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't want banks being worried that they would get paid back. So they created these entities, Fannie and Freddie, to guarantee the mortgages. So that lenders would look to the government to get their money back, not the borrower. Now, of course, they had some standards, some lending standards, but of course, they were fraught with fraud because the banks now, now that they can package these loans and sell them with a government guarantee, the banks didn't give a damn whether the loans were ever repaid because you know they were just going to you know sell them in the secondary market, you know, as a you know security backed by Fannie and Freddie, and so there was all kinds of fraud and corruption because you know the, the, the borrowers know, look, I can lie about this, do this as long as I can get this loan. Fannie and Freddie stamp that's, that's out the door, someone's going to buy it. So all these securities were out there. And of course, you know, they, they start packaging them up. But what happened is then the Federal Reserve like sl slashed interest rates practically to nothing. And so there was, the lower they got, the, the, you know, the easier it was for people to buy these things. But the more demand there was for higher yielding assets like Fannie and Freddie guaranteed debt. Because if you had bonds guaranteed yeah, by Fannie Fannie and Freddie, the Fannie and Freddie loans were not the problem. No, no, let me finish. They, they be yes, they were. Do, don't, you, don't you know that they went bankrupt? Fannie and Freddie went broke because of their loans. They were a victim. They were no, a victim. They were a victim? <laughs> How, they were a victim? They, the Fannie and Freddie loans had a much lower default rate. They were. In fact, there's this great chart of the market that shows like Fannie they, and Freddie loans as a percent they are. of all loans, and it went way down. Yeah, they, the anyway, let, 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 let me, those entities went broke, and more of their loans would have defaulted if the government wasn't, wasn't keeping them in place. So what happened was 
interest rates went very low, very low, and so there was a lot more demand for these types of products because the Fannie and Freddie debt, which everybody thought was government guaranteed, paid a big premium to Treasury. So all the foreign central banks that were recycling our trade deficits that were the result of the cheap money, they were loading up on these things. Now what happened was there was a, there was a group of people that were left out of the market. There were some people that were, that were just so, such bad credit risks that they couldn't even qualify for Fannie and Freddie. Wall Street got involved at that point, right? And because of this huge demand, and because of the cheap financing available from the Fed, without the cheap money, they never would have been able to structure these products. Because the only thing that made subprime markets, subprime mortgages work were teaser rates. That was the only way they could get people on board, was they can give them a, 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 two, a 2 and 28 mortgage, a, you know, 5, five and 25, where for the first few years, courtesy of the government, you had a, a, a subsidized mortgage that you really couldn't afford. And so Wall Street was able to structure these products and sell them. But in order to keep the market going, the biggest buyers of subprime mortgages in the world, Freddie and Fannie. They, got, they didn't issue them, but they bought them up like crazy. And they helped perpetuate that market. Now, yes, at the end of the real estate bubble, that the government inflated, got it going, right, with all their subsidies, whatever they did, yes, a lot of you know, companies and investment banks got sucked in and they took this last piece of the bubble and they got sucked in. And yeah, done that. And they should have they should be bankrupted right now. They're, they should be wiped out. The people who own their debt should have been wiped out instead. The government created the problem and then bailed out everybody else who got in on the action. We made one mistake after another. And is it that the reason that I was able to describe this, and if you have a if you have a free moment, you know, go and look at my YouTube video of uh, uh, Peter Schiff mortgage banker speech from 2006, and watch that for an hour and 15 minutes. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's fun for questions in front of uh, and, you know, people who are interested, and I'll just call them as I can see. Uh, yeah, but we're just, you should be focusing entirely on uh, you know the, the top mortgage uh, assets issue. Now, a lot of economists say that was important, but and, you know it was an, an explosive mix, but it wasn't the most crucial factor. We had credit default swaps. It was completely unregulated. There, the problem wasn't the government. It was the government repealed the, the Glass-Steagall Act. So then, even if you didn't have states in an institution, you could basically buy insurance, except they didn't call it insurance. They called it a credit default swap. So there was no collateral to back it up. And now, estimates, since we don't know what it is, it's a shadow industry because it was completely unregulated, say that that was 50 to $60 trillion. That was the real thing that almost brought the system down. Yeah. And not just America, the world. Iceland collapsed because of that. A lot of uh, towns in Britain collapsed because of that. That was, that was the government actually repealing regulation and not intervening yeah. when they should have. So yeah, what, I mean, your point is that when you have a phony boom, when government keeps money too cheap, right, people, there are mistakes made. No, that but, was a huge mistake. Right, that's well, a mistake. I, but there are gigantic mistakes made in the market because of the false signals that are being sent because of the artificially low interest rates. And I, I wrote about in my book about the derivatives and the credit default. I saw these things, you know, seeing that they were going to happen because they were insuring against events that they didn't think could happen. But yeah, you know, there were a lot of mistakes that were made in the private sector because we didn't have a real interest rate. We didn't have a, a real market. No, you can't no, no, that was a problem of regulation. They made that mistake because it wasn't regulated. No, they weren't we, allowed to do it before. They no. built the act and they let them. No, I agree. The, the problem, problem you talk about, you're talking about the glass steagall. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem. And not only that. Yeah. Well, the problem with that is, at the root of the problem is the government insured bank accounts. Because the government has an FDIC that's insuring banks, right? Banks will act very risky. So yes, given the fact that we're insuring bank deposits, it was a mistake to repeal Glass-Steagall. But if we had repealed the bank deposits, then we wouldn't have needed Glass-Steagall. And, and, and if the government didn't insure banks, the banking system would be much sounder. Because now the banks would be subject to competition, not just in how much interest they pay, but in how safe they are, and how secure their bank deposits are. If there's right one, now, if there's one segment of society that's, yeah. that has been proven over years not to be able to regulate itself, it's the financial sector. What do you mean? mean? <laughs> and we've got boobs and busts over the centuries. We've never had a time when an unregulated banking sector is worth just fine. I'm a huge believer in free markets. They're the greatest creator of value in the world. But financial markets need to be lower. And that, that was the problem of competition. I'm sorry. They just, you know, they, if you call it okay, insurance, let's, let's try it's a legal issue. You have to have a collateral. If you call it a credit default swap, you don't. That was regulation. It wasn't because of interest rate. They were allowed to do that. In the back. Um, you mentioned that. Um, 
that, that you don't think there's a need for regulation. And I, I agree with you on most points that, you know, that it was private spending and so forth, and that even the government was putting pressure on HUD to increase spending of Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac to increase these mortgages, which is understandable. But should it, like, we have gatekeepers in our financial systems, and one of those gatekeepers where I think there's a need for regulations are the credit rating agencies. To use your own metaphor, where you say everyone was drunk up on alcohol, but the the designated driver, the credit rating agency, was also in bed and taking alcohol from the banks. You know, they yeah. should they should have either downgraded these more these securities that once they realized there was nothing back in them, or downgraded the 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 big banks that were backing them up. Obviously, they kept saying, well, they're being backed up by Lehman Brothers, by all these institutions that can't fail, so we're gonna give them triple A agencies. In fact, the SEC identified that credit rating agencies had a lack of regular lack of independence, a lack of regulation back during the Enron scandal, but nothing was ever done. Yeah, I think look, I think that's true. I was you know I was talking about these agencies credit ratings I wrote in my book and in that speech I, there were pay, paper that I knew was rated AAA that I said was going to fail and was F. And I knew that their ratings were bogus. I'm, I'm, other people might have known it too and maybe they looked the other way but ultimately the market would, would, would correct that because companies like Moody's and S&P, you know, their ratings are going to be meaningless. In fact, I think they already are. I think they've already destroyed their brand. The government still uh, you know, sanctions uh, Moody's and S&P as, as, as a, just a few. The government basically says these are the, the ratings that we're going to accept. If you're going to buy assets in a pension, or you know, they have to be rated, and the government approves who the rating agents are, they, so they've already sanctioned them. But, but I think there was a lot of, you know, there was that type of relationship going on between the banks, but I think the market has to ferret that out. And, and, and I think in a free market, the people will start to look for a more unbiased source of an investment rating, or do their own homework, uh, than, than, you know, but to just have the government come in, because when the government comes in and says, okay, you know, that you have even more avenues of, of, of fraud or corruption. What about some type of well, like independent standards that they have, like with you know independent auditors, you know, to have them with the credit aid, like when they have the credit yeah. You know, if see, if the government would simply allow more people to lose money, this would happen on its own. And see, <laughs> it's the moral hazard of bailing people out when they make bad decisions. If the government had let all the creditors of, of Lehman Brothers, you know, lose all their money, right? These things would be happening right now. People would be would be concerned. The government is trying to take the risk out of lending. You can't do that. When you're talking about regulation, markets will regulate because you have greed and fear. People want to make money, but they don't want to lose money. And so that fear of loss causes them to do a lot of things. But when the government comes in and says, don't worry, if you lose, we got you covered, then that the, the market doesn't work. Okay. I've got a hand back here, and then here, and then here. Well, one thing I wanted to point out was I read a, um, an article, a white paper by the Independent Institute, um, and I was a train wreck, and I read a lot of other things, and all the indicators seem to show that there were, in fact, lots of regulations, but all the regulations were encouraging the bubble which we had, and they were basically telling everyone all at the investment banks and at the banks and and at the ratings agencies, this stuff is all highly AAA rated. That it's silly to have these you know absurd lending standards we used to have, and that it's okay for people not to have large down payments, and that all the regulations were pushing everyone to do this kind of behavior. So to say that there was no regulation, I think is is false. What we should say is what were the regulations at the time, and. Should, were those perhaps faulty, and should they have perhaps have been changed and been done differently? And and, yeah, if, and that's a really that, big right. problem. I, I'm doing a study on some of this. There's a difference between what you're saying are regulations and how the regulators interpret them. Uh, and there's a debate going on about whether or not regulators had authority to do, you know, to, to prevent what happened. Or, you know, they, some said they didn't have authority. Some say, well, they did, but they didn't use it. Uh, I actually have a study going on where we're... But they were encouraging it. They were encouraging this behavior. Yeah, they're turning a blind eye. Uh, well, no, actually, they're encouraging it. They're yeah. actually well, no. simply saying you should change your lending standards. Yeah, well, no, well, they, 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 they weren't telling people to change. They didn't tell you know, the ratings agencies what to do. They didn't tell the ratings agencies to start rating these brand new instruments that they never had before. Yeah, they kind of did. <laughs> what government agency told them to do this, they just stepped back and didn't regulate. I mean, 
a regulator is going stepping in and telling people this is how to invest. If you have something that no, no, they're saying these are how lending standards should be. These, these lending standards have changed. Old, the old idea that you should have twenty percent down payments. Now, data idea is it's discriminatory. It's silly. You shouldn't have that anymore. Right, but that isn't that isn't the government making somebody lend any money out. I and mean, I agree well, that you know, there were yeah. low interest rates at the time. Well, well I, I'll tell you, I the market to offer. Yeah, no, I happened to watch an interview on CNBC a few years back with the outgoing head of uh, of Fannie Mae, and he was still there at the time, and it was towards the end of the housing bubble, like 2007-ish or so, and they were changing their standards, and he said that we're changing our standards on arms, okay, going forward, right, and it was going to start in several months, and they said going forward, we will only approve mortgages where the people can actually pay the money back, right? <laughs> They said prior to that, if you took out an arm, Fannie Mae would guarantee the mortgage as long as you could pay the initial teaser rate, even though they knew that you couldn't possibly pay the rate that it would reset to. Yet the government was knowingly guaranteeing those mortgages. And the interviewer said, well, what do you mean? Why were you letting people buy houses you knew they couldn't afford and you knew they would default? And they said, well, the thing was, everybody was getting rich buying real estate and we didn't want to deny people that opportunity. This is the head of Fannie Mae saying, we put a U.S. government guarantee. We let people knowingly buy houses and commit to mortgages that we knew would default, and we guaranteed them anyway because we didn't want to rain on the parade. That was the government. That was the government. And finally, after the fact, they finally said, oh, now we're going to make sure they can handle the whole mortgage, not just the first two or three years. And, of course, you know, before they even had a chance to really implement it, the whole thing fell apart and they went bankrupt. Yeah, I have a question for both Mr. Ship and the professor. Uh, what role did fractional reserve banking play in it, and how do you prevent uh, fractional reserve banking run on the run on the banks and the failure of banks from preventing um, uh, a run on banks in the future? I, I don't see the, the specifics of the of the banking system as being the problem because there's lots of fractional reserve banks that failed as they should and have, you know gone into receivership and they've been moved through the process. So I don't think. <laughs> There, that's the form. I think the real problem is that there seems to be two systems, the you know, systemically important banks and the non-important banks, and that they, the government just lost their guts when it came to dealing with the important banks by bailing them out, by not putting any kinds of conditionals on the money they gave them. And so I don't see it as a problem with the way that we set up our banking system, but with, with the way that it's administered, the way it's regulated. And that I think, I mean, with the previous statement about governments encouraging what happened during the housing crisis, you can go back and forth on that. I think there's no doubt that the government has been under-regulating the major financial players uh, in this business, and now hopefully they're getting a bit of a wake-up call. I mean, the major problem, I mean, with the banking system is number one, all the major banks are insolvent right now. Uh, some of them are pretending to be solvent because of phony accounting, but if they really had to mark their real estate uh, loans to a real market, they'd all be broke. So they're being kept afloat right now by cheap money, by turning around and loan back to the government, they make a big spread, and they're staying in business with positive cash flow. Meanwhile, their their balance sheets are really, you know, they have a huge hole. So all the all the banks are insolvent, and they will fail if we raise interest rates to a level that's appropriate for the economy. Those banks will fail. There probably will not be a run on the banks because the government will guarantee all the deposits, probably, and they will and they will print the money to do it. And that is the ultimate problem, is that they are going to be guaranteeing worthless deposits because the money will be there, but the buying power will not. And as I said earlier in this presentation, that crisis coming in a few years. Guaranteed good deposits. We should be here. No, as long as you don't guarantee the bank. So if you have a deposit in a bank and it fails, I see no problem with the government taking that deposit, giving it to another bank that's healthy, saying you're now with Southwest Bank or whatever, and this bank that's failed, you're gone. I mean, so I don't see any problem in giving the people security to the money state. But it's why? Why, why? Why? You know, I mean, if I put my money in the bank, I'm a creditor of the bank. I've loaned the money to the bank. Absolutely. You, and you want people to monitor that? Uh, yes. All the things they have to do, everything they're supposed you know, to monitor when their bank's going to go under? No, but, you know, there would be, look, people, there would be rating, there would be agencies, there would be, like, consumer reports that would rate yeah. banks. You know, there, I mean, there'd be a free market. There'd be banks that have a good red reputation. And the government doesn't have to inspect chicken, right? Because people could have ratings agencies for salmonella poisoning. Yeah, they could. They could they, probably be less corrupt. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Can, can I get the two of you to talk about it? Why is that? You don't think, can I, can I, get, you don't think I can have a meat inspection business and have my own private label and try to have you a think reputation? I want 5,000 meat inspectors? <laughs> this may help. Can I get the two of you to talk about the economic booms and the busts of the 19th century? where I think we would all stipulate that the level of government regulation was, was far, um, in, in fact, probably non-existent in, in many contexts. So if, if either of you will, will talk about the severity of, of those crises. Well, I, I, I'm not an economic historian, but there was a series of financial panics. Uh, panic of 1820, uh, there's about five or six of the decade, I'm kind of envisioning the graph. Uh, most banks, by the way, then, were state charters. And so banks didn't go beyond their own state borders. And states would use banks as, you know, lots of countries use their banks as, as modes of, uh, that's how they got funded. And so there was tons of corruption in the banking system. And you'd have panics, you'd have run-time banks, you had no regulation at all. And, you know, people would lose money all the time. And because they were afraid of it, they wouldn't put their money in banks. They, you know, stuff it under the mattress or whatever. That's a good example of how banking systems shouldn't be run. You spend, you know, kind of a whole century figuring out some of the basics of bank regulation, part of which is insuring deposits, part of which is inspecting banks for safety and soundness. Uh, and these are all lessons that have worked well. Uh, you know, some people seem to be forgetting them. Like, well, I mean, I think that the 19th century was by far the better century versus the 20th century as far as the success of capitalism in, in our banking system. I think our standard of living grew much greater as a society during the 19th century. I mean, we went through the Industrial Revolution. I mean, when the century began, I mean, people had no electricity. Uh, they were riding on horses. They had outhouses. Uh, you know, uh, by the end of the century, you know, I mean, it was a totally different, different country. We had, you know, we had machines. We had washing machines and sewing machines. We had, you know, we, we, people were, had indoor plumbing. Uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the increase in the standard of living was dramatic. You know, the, the movement of all the people from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy. All the while, prices were falling. I mean, in general, consumer prices in 1900 were lower than they were in 1800. People's wages gained value, their savings gained value. Sure, we did have periods of time where uh, you know, you had increases in money supply uh, during the, certainly during the Civil War when we had we experimented with paper money for the first time. We had some inflation there. There were some periods of time where we had uh, more coinage of silver or gold, and we had you know some you know some problems with money supply growth that was sharp, and we had little booms and busts. But I think overall, under a gold standard, without the government uh, as nearly involved, I think the society prospered. Uh, you know, we, we became a wealthier industrial country. I think we've dissipated most of our, a lot of our wealth uh, this, this century. And I think one of the reasons that we haven't had a, a bigger crisis or panic until now is because the Fed has been so successful at postponing the consequences of our mistakes. But the, the, the price for that success is going to be phenomenal. I mean, we're, we got a taste of it in 2008, but we're going to get a much bigger taste of it in a few years. And I think there's going to be no question that this experiment is an abysmal failure. Okay, so question. I have a question for the professor and Mr. Schiff, a different question for each. Um, first, uh, <laughs> Professor Epstein, uh, and this is regarding when you say when we enter a recession, the government has a responsibility to make sure that people are still working um, and not just doing anything and have to suffer. Uh, one thing that Keynes actually agreed with Mises and the other Austrian economists on is that during a recession, real wages actually have to come down. Um, and so maybe if the government stimulates and puts us back to work or our wages increase nominally, uh, the real wages actually do have to come down. We have to make less money. Our purchasing power uh, is lost. So my question is, should we stimulate at the detriment of the dollar and the purchasing power? And then to Mr. Schiff, I'm in a real estate school right now, and I have brokers coming in all the time trying to recruit us and they always like to give their take on the uh, housing bubble and the housing prices and they all say that the commercial properties are way over leveraged um, even in the housing industry and that they're the next one to, to buckle. So you say that the dollar crisis is next which it seems like we're on that track but do you see uh, commercial stock um, collapse before like commercial property before the dollar actually collapses. All right. So on 
on wages. I, I, Kansas State would say wages tend to fall during this because well, he so actually said they, they must fall. Yeah. They must fall. Um, <laughs> I don't see that as inconsistent with the idea of the government doing what it can to fill an output. It isn't, the problem isn't that wages were too high, it's and the problem was that you know, here assets were being overvalued. Uh, people were being paid wages maybe in those sectors that were out of line, and those wages have to fall. But in the economy overall, there's nothing to say that you know, there's not something we need to squeeze out of the system. So if there's too high wages, we don't have inflation. In fact, now the problem is more deflation than we um, and it's, you know, that's not igniting anytime soon. Now maybe in a few years when we start coming back, we have to make sure the economy doesn't overheat. Uh, but right now, the problem isn't falling wages. The, the problem is people out of work. How, how, how does the back. government actually fill that output gap? What how does anybody do? fill it out? I mean, what is when, the when, a business, do? when a business hires somebody, what do they do? They no, but they I'm asking what money. the government does. You said the government has What's to fill the output. Government? No, when you said the, the government. No, business? Oh, big <laughs> difference. But my question to you is, how does the government, you said government fills the output gap. How, how do they do that? How do they do that? They hire people to... To do what? To build roads, to help build infrastructure. For All right, where do they get the money to do that? They borrow it. From what? No, they borrow from whom? Well, they used to borrow it from us. Now they borrow it from the rest of the world. So the rest of the world lends us money to give so, our own people jobs. All right, so, right, so now we've got to pay that money back at some point yes, with interest. It's an investment. You're supposed to be an economist. It's, a, it's an investment. So the government... So money, now you to but it, but it, these are legitimate investments. So these are legitimate investments that, that everybody is too dumb to make, but no, the government no, no. is going to make There are certain things that the government provides. There's, there's things that we call public goods. Those are the things the government provides. Infrastructure, research, and development. There, there's a space for... The government and the economy, they're doing more of that than what they're doing. They're not suddenly going to the... Right, so what you're saying is, to fill the output gap, the government should plunge the country deep into debt <coughs> to do all sorts of things that it thinks are necessary, like building roads and building bridges, but we should borrow trillions of dollars from China and Japan and, and, and have to pay it back. And you think that makes us wealthier? Okay, uh, absolutely. Going deep into debt makes us wealthier. Going deep into debt. It's called an investment. That's what companies do every day. You but companies are not. Now. Yeah, but companies are not governments. See, companies have a profit motive. They actually make legitimate investments. Well, governments governments just. Motives. No, it's not their money. You said you believe in capitalism. No, it's our money. That's true. We can authorize the government to do. But the government doesn't the government invest. Do. The government Look, they spends. They borrow money. They borrow money from wherever they borrow. Look, they give somebody a job because that person has a job. Wait, does, it, they start does, does Amtrak make any money? Does the money? post office make any money? Does the government run anything right? Does it well? Now you're saying whether they do it well or not. But the question of whether they can't make it is possible. Like well, let me answer his question, though, about the real estate market. But uh, let me answer his question about the real estate market. So on, on commercial real estate, yeah, commercial real estate is a huge problem because what happened during the bubble is uh, interest rates were really low, and a lot of people got all this cheap financing to acquire a real estate, and they made all kinds of rosy assumptions about how much rent they would collect and what their occupancy rates would be. Unfortunately, they're clobbered from every single way you can the cap rates have actually come down because commercial credit is much more expensive now, despite the fact that money is so cheap from the government. Uh, commercial money is hard to come by. Uh, there's a lot of vacancies now in properties, both in, 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 in the commercial, in retail, and the rents are a lot lower than people thought. So these projects are all upside down, and there's a disaster waiting to happen. It is one of the reasons that the government is trying to keep rates as low as they can for as long as they can, because they don't want to pull the rug out from under that. But, you know, it's going to happen, but ultimately, the dollar will probably start to cave in first, and that will ultimately, you know, force up rates and, and, and bring that house of cards down. Okay, we've got two more questions. And then we'll Professor, is every job equal to you? If someone wants their job now, and then the government could pay them to dig holes in the morning or in the afternoon, would that be the same to you as that person getting yeah, a job? Yeah, so there's this whole notion that there's like good jobs and bad jobs. But there's, the, the government 